and I'm going to treat um, reservoir quality from a more of a geological perspective than an engineering perspective. I don't think I have any equations in this lecture, and uh, mainly pictures of the rocks and and uh, porosity types and permeability types and so on. So this first diagram uh, just as a very general introduction to reservoir quality uh, showing the processes that occur once you deposit sediments. So you deposit sediments at a very shallow depth actually at the, the uh, uh, ground surface and then you vary with time, that becomes buried with them, so you get deeper and deeper and deeper, and different processes work on those sediments to change their properties as you increase their uh, depth of burial. So this is kind of general that uh, your original deposition at original deposition, you will have an original porosity and permeability, and so that's at uh, kind of zero depth. And that doesn't change uh, very much as you uh, very, uh, very early uh, burial of the sediment, but you get to a particular depth and you really compact that sediment down. So that's the first process that goes on usually with burial. And as you continue to bury, get in uh, deeper and deeper, uh, pore fluids contain uh, elements in solution, and these at certain depths uh, uh, and pressure and temperature, they will um, uh, deposit cements from the pore fluids. So cementation there. You can also, at uh, some depth, uh, clays can precipitate, orthogenic clays we call them, can precipitate within the matrix of the rock. But uh, you can also get another uh, uh, process called uh, here leaching or dissolution, dissolving. And when you dissolve something, you create porosity. So we call this secondary porosity whereas primary porosity would be the porosity uh, as we have initial deposition and very early burial. And then if we go deeper and deeper and lithify the rocks even more, greater pressure and temperature, we then can fracture the rock and create fracture porosity and permeability. So I showed this before, just porosity and permeability. Uh, I want to start out, if you guys, I imagine, as engineers and geologists, that you look a lot at uh, porosity and permeability data. And there are some pitfalls when you do that, and so I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just telling you what these pitfalls are. And one of them is the measure, measurement technique. When you're taking a core plug, we'll say, taking a core plug to measure porosity and permeability. So this is just a picture of a core. Uh, as geologists, as engineers, engineers want to keep the core whole. Okay, so they can take core plugs. Geologists like to slab the core in half so they can see the sedimentary features that allow them to determine the depositional environment. So there's usually a trade-off and uh, the plugs are taken first and then the core is slabbed. And so here's a slab piece of core here with the core plug taken out for porosity and permeability uh, measurement. Now, the um, 
some of the pitfalls when you uh, are taking core plugs is, for example, um, uh, poor recovery. Here, so yellow is high permeability sandstone, uh, orange is low permeability sandstone, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but this little symbol up here, this is your core plug, but this one is fractured. Okay, see the little fracture right there? Uh, it wouldn't do you any good to take a measurement of that uh, core plug. Wouldn't do any good, it doesn't mean anything. You'll, uh, you'll get a measurement, you'll get a number, but it really doesn't mean anything because you've taken a plug from a fractured uh, rock. Um, where you have interbedded rock types, if you do what we would call statistical sampling, and by that what I mean is where you sample at uniform depths, uh, no matter what the rock type is, uh, so we have interbedded lithologies, and you'll get uh, maybe a distribution something like this, if you do it at uniform depths. Now there's a problem with that, even though that's kind of the standard way the core plugs are taken, are to, um, uh, you'll take a, a core and you'll send it off to a lab and you'll say do every one meter, do a core plug or something, something like that, every third of a meter or something like that. Well, there's problems with that in that if you don't have a uniform distribution of your rock types, but you do have a, a, a uniform distribution of your sampling intervals, you can get, you can build in a sampling bias. What I like to do, and here, this example here is poor core recovery, particularly if you've got fractured zones or faulted zones, you won't get any recovery in those zones. What, um, what I like to do is, uh, and I don't have a picture of this, is to uh, do my sampling of core plugs by the rock type. Because somewhere along the line, I'm going to measure, I'm going to do a rock characterization of the core. And so if I know the porosity and permeability of each different rock type, even though the sampling interval might not be uniform, I will then have a more realistic idea of what the porosity and permeability distribution is of your core. So that's the way I do This is the standard way to do it. And I don't think it's a very good way myself the, uh, because of that reason. You can introduce a sampling bias where even though the cores are recovered at uniform depths, but you can clearly miss a certain rock type. Like here, for example, take a plug here, you take a plug there, you've entirely missed this orange interval right here. Same thing down here, you miss that orange interval. Same thing down here. So you're getting a sampling bias and you're missing some of the, could be permeability barriers or uh, uh, enhanced fluid flow or what have you. So that's the way I like to sample, is uh, for the core plugs for porosity and permeability by, by the rock type. Even if that means an uneven dis distribution of your sampling points. Well, uh, another thing that can be a pitfall or something you want to be careful of is uh, the orientation of your core plug with respect to the orientation of the core. And uh, for example, if you've got a uniform, say, sandstone here, you, uh, the standard type of plug that you take is uh, this way, you're going in perpendicular to the core that gives you what we call the horizontal permeability, KH. 
But uh, sometimes you like to know the vertical permeability as well. So you put a, a, a cork plug, take a cork plug from here, and that will give you KV, the vertical permeability. Now, here's a rock that has some uh, uh, dips to the beds. Okay? This one was a uniform rock. This one has dips to the beds. Now, if you take your cork plug this way, uh, perpendicular to the uh, core, you're going to get uh, a wrong value because you'll have cross-cut two different rock types. So, what you have to be careful to do in that case is make sure your core plugs are parallel to the bedding. So this would be correct. This would be incorrect. This would be correct. This would be correct for a vertical permeability at an angle that's at uh, right angles to your bedding. Um, case here, if you're taking full diameter core uh, that has different rock types in it, uh, if you take a core or full diameter uh, core and measure the porosity in perm, it'll, in this highly layered part right here, I can guarantee you it's going to be different than if you take a uh, a full diameter core and measure porosity and firm in this zone down here. It's more massive. So that's something else you want to take into account. Uh, and then this one down here is you don't want to you try to avoid taking a core plug through a fracture in your in your plug. So here's uh, some typical core plugs from cores. Uh, here's a nice uniform sandstone, same from top to bottom. So you could take a core plug, here's a core plug hole, another one down here, and uh, you can anticipate that the porosity and firm will be about the same. How about here though? Notice how that plug was taken in just this sand body right here, and not this interlaminated sand shale beds here, interlaminated sand shale beds there, but that plug was taken exactly into this sandstone. Well, if you're taking samples at every one third meter interval, <laughs> And you take a sample here and get a measurement of the porosity and firm, is that measurement going to be representative of that one third meter? No, it's not. It's going to be representative of this little sand length right here. This is a point I like to make because it looks very suspicious to me when I'm looking at a plug that was taken exactly in that sand that whoever took the plug was trying to make a, a better reservoir than it might have been, okay? Because this, the sand here has better porosity and firm than the inner layered sand shale here and there. So if you take this as your value as representative, you're gonna calculate uh, two high volumetrics. So uh, whoever did that plug, may have been thinking of that, or the people who take these plugs often get paid by the number of plugs they take in a day. And uh, in this case, probably it could have, well, it could have been easier to take a core plug out of this soft sand than up here. And so the person said, well, you know, what's the difference if it's supposed to be here, or I'll just move it down a Nobody's going to know the difference. So you end up with an erroneous uh, uh, measurement. And these are the things you want to look for if uh, usually when you get your core analysis report back from a company, uh, you'll get core photographs as well. And you should 
but you get your data set like on an Excel spreadsheet or whatever you use to collect your process. Uh, uh, the company gives you the the company that does the core plugging gives you back the analysis in a table form like Excel. You should check that against the picture to make sure that you've got good, valid, representative core plugs. And if you have to throw away a couple, then you throw them away, rather than use uh, uh, non-representative data. And then here's one down here that goes through three different rock types. Okay, this plug is a little sand here, little shale there, and then an alternating very thin sand shale in it. So, if you could measure the permeability and porosity of each of these three, they'd be different. But you're getting a combination of those, which is quite different than any anywhere else on this piece of core. You could take a core plug anywhere else and it's going to be different than what you see here. So again, that gives you an erroneous uh, non-representative, I should say, a non-representative uh, number for porosity and permeability. So, these are quality control issues that you uh, should do before you start using your porosity and permeability data. Some of the other things, you know, like I say, you want to you really know your um, the rock that you're taking your plug from. Here's an example of a very nice sandy reservoir with um, uh, about a couple hundred milligarsi permeability here and here, but uh, a sample taken here gives you zero porosity and permeability. And that's because um, this feature here is a concretion, which is a very solid carbonate usually, very solid, and you can just barely see the outline of the concretion right there, a little bit grayer color. So if you took the core plug in here, you get zero porosity and permeability, and it wouldn't be representative of all of this piece of core. So again, you'd be writing off some of your uh, uh, of your potential reservoir. You'd be calling it non-reservoir, this interval right here. But it would be reservoir. Like I say, it's a couple hundred milligarsi of permeability in the sand above and below that concretion. Here's just some concretions and outcrops. Very dense, non-porous, non-permeable. Well, one thing you can do is to take spot measurements rather than core plugs. Now, you can't do that for porosity, but you can do it for permeability. And uh, there's a device called a pressure decay permeometer that allows you to take about a, uh, about a millimeter in diameter analysis of the permeability. And this is just a portable one here. Uh, what you do basically is uh, you uh, flow a gas, a nitrogen gas in this case. You flow it uh, through uh, some um, recorders. And then the gas flows through a little chamber here. And uh, uh, the nitrogen gas then penetrates the, uh, the, the sand. And, uh, the more penetration you get of the gas the high, over a given period of time, the higher the permeability will be. And you can calibrate that. And so uh, something like this, here's a piece of core. 
where we took the core plug measurement right in there, 19 millidarsies it gave us. But when we took, uh, or when, I didn't do this work, but when, when the uh, pressure decay permeometer was used to, this was a highly layered sand, we got one millidarcy perm here, 15.5 here, 10 millidar, uh, one. One millidarcy here, 120, 25, 36.5, and so on. So quite a bit of variability due to the depositional processes by which this was formed. And so you, uh, that is something that if you're going to put into a reservoir simulator, uh, this is a typical problem that you have with thin bedded reservoirs, and that you're going to get this level of variability in your porosity and permeability. And so uh, this is something that you would like to capture. You would not like to upscale it out and say, well, we'll just call this interval 19 millidarcies, when in fact it doesn't resemble 19 millidarcies. And so your reservoir fluids, in this case, you're gonna finger in through the uh, high perm zones like this one here and that one there, uh, you'll get a lot of fingering of your uh, fluids. And uh, this is what a pressure decay permeometer looks like in a lab setting, where you, you have your core here, and it's all kind of automated. You have your pressure gauges here, you have your, I don't know where the tank uh, of gas is, but it's somewhere back there. And you just go along and um, uh, take a, a measurement here and then move the uh, needle, the, um, move the uh, little uh, pointer that takes the measurement, move it over a little bit, and some more, some more, some more, and record all your measurements on the computer. When you do something like that, what it allows you to do is, for example, um, make maps of your reservoir. And uh, here, for example, is a, a slab of reservoir that uh, the permeability has been mapped through that reservoir. So the different colors mean different permeability. And uh, this might be a very small uh, piece of core but you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, variability in the permeability. Another issue, uh, again, a quality control issue, is when you have unconsolidated sands. And all of these are cork plug holes, but the sands are unconsolidated. So you take them with the sleeve, take your sample, but when you push that sample of that the sleeve or cylinder in to the unconsolidated rock, you're going to get some movement of the grains. And when you pull it out, you're going to get some movement of the grains. And then if you wrap this up and ship it to a company to take a, perme uh, to take a porosity and permeability measurement, you're also going to move some grains around. So uh, by the time you've taken the core to the time that the core reaches the person who's doing the analysis, that unconsolidated core has been jiggled around quite a bit. And when you change the uh, arrangement of the grains, you're changing the permeability. Here's an example of, uh, of that. So you might have started out with a kind of a packing of grains like this where the white areas in between are porosity, but by the time the, the plug gets to its destination to be analyzed, the grains might have moved over something like this, and thus uh, reducing your permeability, your measured, your measured permeability. The permeability that you measure will not be the same as under reservoir conditions. One more slide and then we'll go to lunch. 
just the effect of overburden stress on permeability. So this uh, vertical plot here is fraction of the original permeability in a rock. So down here means that um, uh, by applying an overburden stress, you did not change the permeability at all. Whereas a plot up here means you uh, eliminated all the permeability during overburden stress. So, uh, did I say that by fraction of original permeability? No, I said that, I think I said that in reverse. If you have a very low fraction of your original, excuse me, a very high fraction of your original permeability, that uh, means that the permeability has not changed much you apply an overburden stress. Whereas down here, um, where you have a high, uh, uh, a low fraction of your original permeability, that means you reduce that uh, permeability quite a bit. And so as you would expect, unconsolidated sediments, as you increase the pressure, uh, you decrease the permeability this case by about almost uh, uh, 80%. You reduce the permeability. A friable, partially cemented, I give you a curve something like this, and well cemented might give you a curve like this or a curve like that. You, uh, with cementation, you now have a rigid framework, and so you uh, don't compact very much when you apply an overburden stress, and uh, uh, so you don't lose much permeability. Okay, well with that, uh, why don't we break for lunch and start again, what, at two o'clock?